Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth statistics lesson. In this video, we're gonna talk about bias. First, we're gonna define bias and then identify some different sources of bias. So bias is the degree to which a procedure systematically overestimates or underestimates a population value. So let's go back to the first lesson to give this some context. Remember, we talked about convenient sampling and we talked about how convenient sampling can sometimes produce misleading results. In particular, we used an example of a teacher in a health and nutrition department who samples her own students to try to determine the diet habits of college students. And what we concluded is that this is very likely to overestimate the diet habits. In other words, her students are more likely to eat better than the average college student. So that's actually an example of bias. That's exactly what we're talking about, is that is a procedure that in that case overestimates a population value, right? It overestimated the dietary habits of college students. So that's what we're talking about. Just as an example, when we're talking about bias, we're talking about procedures that either overestimate or underestimate a population value. So let's get into some different examples of sources of bias. So the first type of bias we're going to talk about is voluntary response bias. A voluntary response survey is one in which people are invited to log on to a website, send a text message, or call a phone number in order to express their opinions on an issue. Since people with strong opinions are more likely to volunteer to participate, voluntary response surveys are highly biased. And just to give an example of this, we give out course evaluations. And these are voluntary. We recommend that you take course evaluations and evaluate your teacher. So for example, last semester I taught a class with 30 students and I think 12 of them actually completed this evaluation. There were a lot of positive responses and there were some really negative responses. That's what we're talking about here is that the people most likely to respond to a survey like that when it's voluntary are people who really like me as a teacher or really don't like me as a teacher. So there are most likely a lot of people in the middle there who didn't actually get surveyed because they didn't want to volunteer for, to participate. They didn't have a strong opinion either way, so they didn't really care, right? So that's just an example. Voluntary response surveys have a serious potential to be biased. All right, so the next type of bias we have is called self-interest bias. And the example we have here is that physicians are sometimes paid by drug companies to test their drugs and to publish the results of these tests in medical journals. People who have an interest in the outcome of experiments have an incentive to use biased methods. This happens a lot with physicians and scientists, and it even ha happens in academia, right, when we're doing academic research. If I'm testing some teaching method that I came up with and I really want to promote, most likely I'm going into that test trying to show that it works, that it's better than the other method. So that automatically sets me up to be more likely to be biased, to have an incentive to be biased. So this is a potential source of bias called self-interest bias. So here's another type of bias, and it's called social acceptability bias. And this has to do with things that are stigmatized or seen as not socially acceptable. And it turns out that people are reluctant to admit to behavior that may reflect negatively on them. For example, if we took a random sample of 100 college students and asked them if they have used any illegal drugs since they've been in college, it is likely that many of the students who have used illegal drugs will answer no to the question because they are concerned that admitting to illegal drug use is not socially acceptable and may reflect negatively on them. So the procedure that we're using to determine the proportion of college students who use illegal drugs is underestimating. It's very likely underestimating the actual proportion who do. And that's because illegal drug use is not seen as socially acceptable. There's a stigma around it. So many people are likely to lie, right? Those who have used illegal drugs are more likely to say no, and therefore this procedure is biased. And the results we cannot trust. So the next type of bias is called leading question bias. This is actually very common. Sometimes questions are worded in a way that suggests a particular response. For example, a political group that supports lowering taxes sent out a survey that included the following question. Do you favor decreasing the heavy tax burden on middle class families? So these words, heavy and burden, 
suggest that taxes are too high and encourage a yes response. A better way to ask this question is to present it as a multiple choice question. So what is your opinion on decreasing taxes for middle class families? And then give choices, strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, neutral, somewhat agree, and strongly agree. But this question is not worded in a way that suggests a yes or no answer. It's a lot more neutral and therefore using this question is going to produce a lot more reliable results. Using this previous question is more likely to overestimate the proportion of people who favor decreasing taxes for middle class families. So next we have what's called non-response bias. People cannot be forced to answer questions on or participate in a study. In any study, a certain proportion of people who are asked to participate refuse to do so. These people are called non-responders. In many cases, the opinions of non-responders tend to differ from the opinions of those who do respond. As a result, surveys with many non-responders are often biased. So if I send out 500 surveys and I get back 20 responses, right? Let's say I own a business. I'm, I'm sending out surveys. Are you satisfied with our product? I send out 500. I get 20 back. 19 of them say yes. Can I then claim that 95% of customers are satisfied with the product? No, because there's this potential for non-responders to have different opinions that are not being accounted for. So anytime you see a lot of surveys sent out and very few coming back, it's very likely that there's some sort of non-response bias going on that makes the results less reliable. Lastly, we're going to talk about sampling bias. Sampling bias occurs when some members of the population are more likely to be included in the sample than others. For example, samples of convenience almost always have sampling bias because people who are easy to sample are more likely to be included. It's almost impossible to avoid sampling bias completely, but modern survey organizations work hard to keep it at a minimum. So this is going back to that first example where we take a sample of convenience and it's really tying into this idea of having a sample that does not represent the population, a sample that differs from the population in some major way, right? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about sampling bias, is that certain members of the population are more likely to be included in the sample than others. In other words, the sample does not represent the population. So hopefully this makes sense. If you have questions, send me an email, drop by my office hours, and I hope you have a great day. See y'all later.